you who saw us as we convened into closed session. Uh, we took up part of our closed session agenda, but not all of it. Um, there was no reportable action on any of the items that we discussed yesterday. We will reconvene into closed session to finish that, and at that time, we'll let you know whether there's any reportable action from the remaining items. Uh, Madam Secretary, may I have the roll call, please? Broughton? Here. Chen? Not present. Cisneros? Here. Dela Cruz? Here. Duran? Here. Noel? Here. Seleg? Here. Shelby? Present. So? Present. Collings? <coughs> Present. Tony? Present. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We will resume with our uh, bunch of items related to the discipline system 705, 706, and 707. Item 705 is the annual discipline report review and approval timeline. And we have Ms. Shang and Ms. Chavez, please. Good morning. I'm hoping they're here. Morning. Good morning. So this agenda item is about the annual discipline report. Uh, we will need the board of trustees to confirm that you will review, evaluate, and approve the annual discipline report, which is due on October 31st. My understanding is that we will organize a special meeting for you to provide feedback or ask questions about the report. Uh, I just want to highlight uh, two significant changes uh, in this year's report. One change is, as you have heard, the timeline has changed. Uh, it used to be due on April 30th. This year, per SB 211, it's, it's due on October 31st. Uh, another change is we have been reporting our data in discipline system uh, based on calendar year. Uh, this year, we will need to report both calendar year and fiscal year. Uh, then starting from next year, we will switch to uh, fiscal year uh, reporting. This is required also by SB 211. Uh, we attached the procedures for us to produce, re produce this report uh, uh, in the agenda item. Uh, please review it and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you, Ms. Shang. Any questions, Mr. Tony? Um, I'd appreciate clarification on the difference between calendar year and fiscal year. It was my understanding that the state bar has a fiscal year that coincides with its calendar year. So calendar year uh, means from January 1st to December 31st. For this year's report, it will be report reporting data from January 1st, 2021 to December 31st, 2021, that's the calendar year. And we have been reporting the calendar year data in, in all the past uh, annual discipline reports. Uh, this year, um, we are asked to report both. So fiscal year this year would be uh, uh, July 1st, 2020, 2020 to, uh, uh, sorry, July 1st, 2021 to June uh, 30th, 2022. The state fiscal year, Mark. Okay, I, I, that's an important distinction for us to just clarify and make clear. It's mm -hmm. not far as fiscal year. Any other questions? I, uh, Mr. Select. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I mean, I think the legislature just has directed us to change the fiscal year to start in June or July, whatever, or no. Not for our budget. But, this is but for, for reporting. the reporting. Yes, yeah. this is, is the bridge year, and I think that's what um, Ewing was saying that this year we have to present the data both ways, and then going forward, will the ADR will be presenting state fiscal fiscal year time periods only. We oh, I see. But but our fiscal year is still the calendar year, notwithstanding that. Yes. I didn't. Okay. Our budget. Thanks for clarifying. I didn't understand that. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's a minor quirk of SB 211 that we're going to have to learn to live with, right? In terms of our 
discipline reporting, essentially. And hopefully it's clear in this agenda item, the reason this particular item is being brought forward is because of an audit recommendation that directed the board to um, approve the procedures by which the annual discipline report will be completed. So that's what the attachment is that you're being asked to approve. And I think one of the, one of the things <laughs> most critical to me is that it means we need to plan a special meeting for next month uh, to review the discipline report and, and to approve it. So you all should have, I think, by this time received a notice from the secretary trying to coordinate our schedules. So thank you for your assistance with that. If you haven't yet uh, responded to the poll, please do so. Any other questions? Seeing none, may I have the resolution on the screen, please. Okay, there you have it. Any changes to that language? Motion by Stallings. Oh. Wake up, folks. Mark Broughton has a question. I'm sorry, Mark Broughton, you have a question? Uh, yes, this was not something that was, uh, the discussion was started yesterday. In other words, I'm not precluded, if you will, from uh, voting on this. That is correct. Item. These are all fresh items today. As a matter okay, of fact, that you. was the rationale, so we could all be fresh in the morning. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> is that a second, Mr. Broughton? Uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Any discussion? May I have the vote? Broughton? Yes. Chen, absent. Cisneros? Aye. De La Cruz? Yes. Noel? Yes. Salai? Yes. Shelby? Aye. Soul? Aye. Stallings? Aye. Tony? Aye. Eight ayes, zero nays, one absent. The motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. It takes us to item 706, the Office of Chief Trial Counsel Performance Metrics. This is a discussion and a presentation only. And, and uh, good morning, Mr. Cardona. Good morning. All right. Uh, so, um, so we have some slides, but basically this will be a presentation of quantitative metrics um, related to the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. Um, and once we get the slides up, I will show. There we go. So they are available in a dashboard um, that's interactive. Um, it has ways that you can parse the data in different ways using menus. Yes, I will get the microphone closer to me so that I sound incredibly loud. Um, but the interactive dashboard is basically updated on a regular basis um, and it will be provided and my understanding is that this will be a standing agenda item so that you can go through the data whenever you want. Um, so basically this is what the first page of the dashboard looks like and as you can see there are numbers, um, a number of different metrics. Um, all of these have backup data on pages that follow this initial page in which you can see trends in the data, which is in my mind a little bit more important uh, to see the trends and we'll look at two different ways you can see those trends um, over different periods of time. Uh, the numbers in blue or black are ones that reflect improvements from the prior quarter or in the case of the last number, the projected backlog, um, an improvement from prior years. The ones in red are ones that reflect um, non-improvements uh, or decreases um, from prior quarters and it's based on each quarter. So going across them and we'll talk about these more when we get to the other pages, you have caseload clearance rate, um, which is basically the number of cases cleared, which is closed um, as compared as a percentage to the number of cases we receive. So our goal there is to have a one 100% case clearance rate. In other words, we are clearing as many cases as we receive so that our inventory isn't increasing. Median days to close and average days to close are basically the time from our receipt of a complaint to the time that it's closed. Um, median days in investigation, average days in investigation um, relate to the time period that a complaint is an investigation, that is after it's gone through intake and has been moved to investigation. <coughs> Um, and before it moves to the charging stage. Um, the numbers on the bottom row, the percent of cases that spent more than 365 days in an investigation. Remember that our current statutory uh, time guidelines are 180 days for non-complex cases, 
and 365 days for complex cases. And so more than 365 days, um, a case that spent that amount of time investigation would automatically be in backlog, <coughs> even if it was complex. <coughs> uh, the number next to that is a measure of the cases closed in less than 180 days. Um, again, looking at the lower end of our current time guidelines. And then the next two numbers are basically qualitative measures um, or quantitative measures of quality. Uh, in other words, the CRU the, is the complaint review unit, um, which reviews on request. In other words, if OCTC closes a complaint and the complainant then wants that reviewed, that, would, that review would be done by the complaint review unit. And so this is a measure of the percentage of cases that the complaint review unit on review determines should be sent back for additional um, action, in other words, reopened. Similarly, the random audit reopens for substantive reasons is our semi-annual, or sorry, biannual, sorry, semi-annual uh, random audit of closed cases by the outside auditor who reviews a random sample, and then that's the percentage that is recommended for reopening. So again, that's a qualitative measure of our uh, accuracy in closing cases. And then the backlog number is basically the total of number of cases projected to be in backlog for each year. Um, so you can see those measures. Um, moving to the next page, um, we'll see a page that kind of breaks out this data in more detail and allows you to look at trends. So this is our total case inventory. As you can see, it went up from the previous quarter. Um, and as you can see on the right, there's been a trend of increase. Um, we are seeing an increase in the number of cases coming in and intake. Um, we're almost back to pre-COVID-19 levels in terms of the number of complaints that are being filed on a weekly and monthly basis. Um, the next number is the percent of cases that are greater than 180 days old. As you can see, that's decreased. And you can see in the graph on the bottom right, um, the trend for that, um, the dark blue column on the left, is the number of cases that are less than 180 days. The other two columns are cases that are older than that. So you can track that across trends. Um, this page shows trends from quarter one of 2021 through quarter two of 2022. Um, on the next page, we'll show a different uh, breakdown in terms of time. This takes a longer time period so that you can see longer trends in the data. And so you can see on the top, uh, the trend in our case inventory from quarter one of 2019 through quarter two of 2022. And on the bottom, the inventory by case age, again, tracking the numbers of cases that are less than 180 days, between 181 and 365 days, and greater than 365 days. Um, in terms of the trends, if you look at this, what you'll see is that basically um, the inventory by case age generally lags um, the inventory, in other words, you'll see the case age increasing over time as our inventory mod, uh, moves. So as our inventory increases, typically we'll see lagging behind that an increase in the case time as more cases stay in the system longer because they're clogging up the system. So turning to the next uh, page, this is a breakout of some of the other statistics. Um, again, the caseload clearance rate, and you can see the trend in that across from quarter one 2021 to quarter two 2022. Um, typically, we stay between 90 and 100 percent on that. Um, our goal is to get that to 100 percent, but as you can see, it, it does vary over time. And then below that, you'll see a graph that shows the trend over time in cases closed by case age so that you can also see that. As you'll see, typically, uh, we have been somewhere between 70 and 80 percent in terms of the cases that are closing in less than 180 days. Over at the right, um, you'll see the difference between average case age at closure and median case age. You'll note that the median line um, is smoother. Um, the average line can be drastically affected by a few cases that close as extraordinarily long time levels, and that's exactly what happened in Q2 2022. We had a group of cases that were very old at the time we finally closed them, and that drove the average up. And then the next page is basically the same thing, but with a longer term trend, so that again, you can see the kind of norm 
across, which is basically what I just talked about, um, and the occasional spikes in average case age caused primarily by groups of cases that are very old and temporarily drive up the average as compared to the median. The next page um, looks at some of the other statistics, the time that cases spend in each uh, phase, um, and so you can see that uh, in the graph on the top from quarter one, uh, 2021 through quarter two, 2022, um, and then on the right in graphs showing the duration of cases in each phase. As you'll see, the intake time um, basically stays the same. These are cases that move very quickly through intake and typically close within a very short period of time in intake. You'll see more variation in investigation. Uh, but then in the last graph on the right, you'll see the spike in charging. That's that group of cases that I told you about that were extraordinarily long that we finally closed in charging, which drove up the average time as compared to the median. And then on the next page, you can see the same thing with longer term trends across these same statistics. Next page um, is, oh, wait, we lost one. Huh. Okay, well, I thought we had a chart of our disciplinary filings, but we don't. Um, I'll see about getting that included. Um, then that posted, um, yeah. Oh, okay, it got moved out of order. Um, so let's go to this one next, um, our disciplinary filings. Um, you can see, again, trends in our filings of notice of disciplinary charges, stipulations to facts and discipline, and criminal conviction transmittals, which are the three types of things that we file to seek discipline. Um, as you can see, um, in Q2 2022, that number went up to 176 total. Um, and you can see kind of the trend across um, from a low of 109 in Q3 2021, um, increasing to where we are now, which is probably back more towards the norm of what we should be seeing. So now I'll go back and pick up the qualitative measures. Um, so here you can see trends across time of the uh, percent of complaint review unit reopens. Um, we've seen a small spike in that, um, up to about 2.5% from our target of 2% over the last two quarters. We're looking into what might have caused that. Um, and then the random, re -audit, random audit reopens for substantive reasons. Again, we've seen a spike in that. Again, remember that this is looking back. Our random audit lags. Um, so the last random audit looked at cases through February of 2021. Um, we are looking at what caused that um, and are trying to sort that out, and we'll see what the next couple of random audits show. The percentage of Walker petitions denied, um, we shoot to have that be 100%. Um, we had one that was granted in Q2 2022. Um, so uh, we will continue to try and keep that at 100%. That's the Supreme Court's review when complainants seek review of a decision to close in the Supreme Court. Next one, uh, when we close complaints, um, we have asked the complaining witnesses to fill out a survey. Um, this is a self-selecting group of complainants. Not all complainants fill out the survey. And on the right in the graphs, well, on the left, you'll see some general comments. Um, on the right, you'll see the responses. Um, in general, we are looking for higher numbers. Um, five would be strongly agree with a statement that they were provided with meaningful access or good access, and then similarly for fairness. So we're looking to try and drive those numbers up. Um, you can see that over time, um, they have been for access um, in around the four level and in fairness around the three level. Um, we're gonna try and drive those fairness numbers up. The two columns, the difference you'll see, the numbers are generally lower for intake where complainants have much less contact with us. In other words, the intake cases include those in which we have simply received the complaint, reviewed it, determined that there's absolutely nothing there that warrants investigation and sent a letter to the complainant advising of them of that. Um, in investigation, typically we will have had more contact with the complainant and so you'll see a general trend that the numbers for both access and fairness are higher once a case gets to an investigation and there is some of that contact. 
Um, this then is a, a look at our turnover. Um, as you can see, um, we've had a recent spike um, in turnover amongst our investigators, 5.4% um, and 9.1%. Um, in the last two quarters, um, we've had a number of investigators retire. We've also lost a number of investigators to the private sector um, for jobs that paid them significantly more and in some instances were in environments where they could work 100% remote. Um, we will see what happens with this, um, but we're looking at a number of mechanisms for trying to retain more of our more senior investigators um, who have those types of employment opportunities available to them. Um, this is somewhat troubling um, because it takes us time to train up investigators. And so when we lose our experienced investigators to other positions, um, it decreases the um, knowledge level amongst our investigator pool as a total. Um, it means that we have more investigators who take longer to investigate cases because they simply don't have the experience. Um, so we are looking at ways to try and turn that around um, and put in place some things that we hope will make it more attractive for people to stay longer um, so that we get more value from, our, from the extensive training that we do when people come in. And that is it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Cardona. That was very... Um very elucidating, actually. I'm very excited about the, the dashboard. Any questions? Trustee Shelby. Good morning. I just have a question in terms of, so you present this to us at the board, but externally, you know, <laughs> backlog, discipline, that's, that's so high on the, the legislature's list. Do you interact with um, judiciary on Senate or, or, or assembly side to kind of share with them the metrics that you've provided to us as well, or how does um, that transpire? I'm sorry, I haven't had enough coffee, so. No, no, I, I understand your question. Um, no, I have not I have not gone through this with, um, with Senate judiciary. Oh. The only reason I ask that question is because knowledge is powerful, and so I, I think, and I don't think it has to be a standing sort of interaction, but I think periodically just kind of picking up the phone and highlighting different things keeps people informed. And so when you get to the end, people don't feel like they are caught off guard and it, and it keeps them engaged. And so it's just a suggestion. Sure. Thank you for that. I totally agree. Uh, remember, folks, to use your microphone because we've got participants on Zoom that won't hear us unless we're speaking directly into it. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Sowell. George, I, I appreciated the, the presentation and I like the, uh, like the dashboard. I, I have uh, three uh, sort of quick comments or comments slash questions. Um, the first one is, can you just remind me definitionally what it means when a case is, is closed? Is that, or do we make distinctions between uh, cases that are closed that don't get to um, get to the investigative stage versus uh, cases that have to go entirely through the process. So there are, is there different terminology for, you know, cases that are closed, I guess maybe earlier in the process or closed is just however uh, they are closed. So right now closed means closed at any of the stages, whether in intake, investigation, or in charging. As we'll see in the next presentation, which talks about our proposed case processing standards, there we would differentiate um, between closures that occur in intake, which is right after the case comes in, and closures that occur after the case is referred and undergoes some investigation. All right, you can see then I didn't read ahead. Uh, the, um, uh, my second question is, are there any um, external factors that you think may be attributed to, uh, it looks like there's been a sort of a, a spike in the number of cases of, you know, from Q1 to Q2, and. You know, are there other things, you know, the pandemic, you know, folks, you know, I, I, I'm just wondering what else may be going on that, that may, may be causing some of this. Yeah, we saw, a, we saw a decrease in the number of complaints that came in during the pandemic, and you can actually see that trend. It kind of decreased as the pandemic started and remained at a lower level through the pandemic. Over the last two quarters, we've seen kind of a return in the number of complaints to get close to what were the pre-pandemic levels. So it looks like we're coming back to kind of the baseline for complaint filings that was in place prior to the pandemic. 
Gotcha. Um, and then I was, um, I was sort of struck by your comment uh, relative to um, uh, us losing investigators. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of very interested in uh, some, of the, some of the tactics that we might take in order to, one, try to uh, retain investigators, but also attract them uh, to uh, to the um, uh, to the to, to state bar related work. Um, is there a um, it, does the investigator um, classification lend itself to I don't know uh, para investigators, uh, for lack of a better phrase, or apprenticeship type investigators, or um, is there some sort of a, a quasi before you're a full-fledged investigator type uh, pipeline that we could uh, we could develop? So we we actually hire investigators who have very, a number of different levels of experience. So we actually hire some people who don't necessarily have extensive investigative experience um, and train them up. So we've hired people who have been paralegals. We've hired people who have been in other types of positions who would demonstrate uh, both a desire and the skills to be investigators and do train those people up. Um, one of the things we're looking at is the potential for having some of our paralegals, if they're interested in becoming investigators, provide an opportunity for that. Um, we're also looking at um, you know, some, of the, some of the issues that investigators have raised with the job have been uh, concerns with um, uh, what they view as procedural hurdles um, to getting investigations done. So we're trying to address those in terms of our case management system, in terms of some of our procedures um, to try and allow investigators to focus more on analysis and investigation as opposed to uh, paper processing and other things that are less attractive tasks. Um, so we are looking at a number of those things. Um, uh, did that answer your question or? It, it, it does. I'm just trying to, you know, I just wonder if between Q2 and, and Q3, when we see this, ne your, your next report, if we have fewer investigators, does that mean that we're going to see, you know, sort of you know, spikes in 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 uh, in times uh, you know in in time related to you know cases um, because we don't have a, a enough of a, an investigative force, and I'm I'm wondering if uh, that also would speak to you know I don't know if there you can contract out for investigating, and I just wonder if there's a tipping point as it relates to any of that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we have had success in getting new investigators. In other words, we just, for example, on this, uh, the start of September, um, we had a group of seven or eight new investigators start, and we're in the process of hiring more. So we're able to replace the ones that left. But that doesn't solve the problem, and, and you probably will see some increase in time because if we replace 10 experienced investigators with 10 new investigators, there's a lag time before those 10 new investigators are able to handle the same levels of caseloads as the 10 more experienced investigators who left. So it does affect the timing of our investigations because those 10 new investigators will take longer to handle the same number of cases. Um, so that, that, uh, that kind of cycle um, and that's something that we're going to try and to take into account when we do the um, staffing analysis for the SB 211 um, case processing standards, um, which is something that um, Yuin will talk about, but that's something that we're trying to work into the uh, staffing analysis, the need for training and the relative ability to handle caseloads when a new investigator is in training. You got it. Uh, final comment would just be that I agree with board member Shelby that um, we need to, we should try to figure out some sort of cadence by which uh, the legislature gets uh, uh, an opportunity to uh, to hear you go over uh, some of these the stats here in the in the dashboard as well as get familiar with it. Um, so um, uh, just offer that. I I think that's a good idea, and we'll work on what we can do to to accomplish that. Thank you, Trustee Sowell. Trustee uh, Tony, please. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to see this report, George. Thank you very much. Um, 
I, I'm going to start with a couple of questions I have on the uh, first slide. And I, I'm wondering whether it's a uh, j just a labeling uh, typo on the very last figure says projected 2001 backlog. And I'm wondering <laughs> if that was actually a 2001 backlog, because I figure you probably know the numbers by now. Um, it should be 2021, if that's the first slide. Uh, right. The very last uh, number, the 2,355, is labeled projected 2001 backlog. That, that, that is a typo. That should be projected 2021 backlog. You mean 2022? It no. says 2021. It should be 2021. We don't yet have the numbers. Um, so you don't have the numbers for 2021 correct, yet? Correct. For okay. 2022. But do you have them for 2021? Yes. So that number is for projected for 2021. So if you look at the slide that's up there yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. So that number, 2,355, is the projected backlog for 2021. Okay, so my question is, we're in September of 2022. Just help me understand why wouldn't we know now what the backlog is for 2020. I, I, I'm not understanding no, what this understand. means. No, so, understand. Um, oh. So that, that label is the projected backlog, meaning that the data hasn't been finally confirmed, which will be in the ADR. Oh, okay. Um, and the okay. ADR will actually also have numbers um, okay, through. Good. Okay, thank you. That's cl that that okay. clarifies that for me. Um, my second question has to do with the caseload clearance rate, and it has to do with the goal. Um, you, you, you had uh, mentioned on some of the other slides that the goal is 100%. Uh, and I understand that to mean that you want uh, the same number, an equivalent number of clearances as new cases comes in. That's what the 100%. And I, you know, I, I, what I want you to think about uh, you know, for future is that I don't know how to reduce a backlog without having that goal exceed 100%. I, I, I just don't know that you, you do that. So, so I would have you consider um, a goal that actually exceeds 100% because that, indi that would indicate a at least aspiration to reduce the backlog. So that's, that, that's just a math thing. Under, understand. Okay, um, so y you can look at that and think about that. So, so I, I want to bring up one issue of concern, and this is something, you know, you're, you're still in the beginning stages of your leadership here with the um, um, OT, um, the uh, Office of Chief Trial Counsel, okay? And so some of the figures we see here are due to legacy. Okay, um, uh, you know, uh, leadership before you. And so uh, one thing I, I, I get concerned about is when I hear, okay, the numbers of complaints during the pandemic um, decreased, okay, which is, you know, that shouldn't surprise anyone. But I sit here wondering, I'm presuming that the staff thing did not decrease proportionally, and I'm left to wonder why didn't the backlog get get reduced during that, what well, seemed like an opportunity. Now, you can't answer all that because you weren't here, but I just want you to be aware that that's the kind of question that someone looking at this might ask, and at some point it might be good for you to think about, well, you know, what's a rationale and how you know, what's needed to make sure that as the numbers increase, as uh, Trustee Soul indicated, that then we don't get huge spikes and then blame it strictly on the pandemic numbers being low because to, to do that um, authentically, we would have wanted to see those um, the backlog reduced during that pandemic time. I, I think you get my main picture. So, and you don't have to have a full answer right now, but I'm trying to give you a preview of what I think in the future it would be nice to have an understanding from a board uh, member's perspective. 
No, I understand, and I mean, I think we need to operate on the assumption that our baseline number of complaints is going to be the pre-pandemic levels and design mechanisms to handle that level of cases within um, what hopefully our new case processing standards will be. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Sorrell. Thank you, Mr. Cardona. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Select, please. Uh, so what's the status of um, the work into estimating what staffing level we need at OCTC to be effective at processing complaints? Because, because we do have this tension. We want to reduce the backlog, but we also know that focusing too much on that can cause meritorious cases to be closed, which is a problem. So it's, it's a difficult balance, and the, the solution is making sure we have the right number of people Right. So we'll, we'll be discussing that in connection with the case processing standards, okay. which is the next agenda item. Yeah. Okay. And just to remind you, you know this, Sean, but others on the board, we did do an analysis of how many more investigators and attorneys would be needed to meet the statutory um, current backlog standards of 180 days, 365 days, and that was... Um, I can't believe I can't remember it right now. 58. 58. New positions. Um, and 19 of those were funded when we got the fee increase. But what we're going to talk about in the next item is with respect to the new case processing standards, our identification of the necessary staffing levels to right. achieve those. Yeah, so we'll talk about that. But the, the 58, that's from several years ago. So we were looking at freshening up that analysis, but well, focused on the new standards. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I was just wondering if Highlander or Jose, I just wanted to make sure that the board um, is, is aware that this dashboard, actually a more extended version of it, that includes, um, I think the primary um, sort of addition that it includes is feedback that comes through from employees via the anonymous online um, employee inbox system, which is called Incognito. So Highland and Jose get this dashboard plus the Incognito feedback relevant to OCTC and any other kind of emails that I get from complainants or respondents. Um, and they have been going, sitting down with George and going over all of that data once a quarter. So I just was hoping you would share with your colleagues uh, what you do during that process and just want to make sure the board is aware of that. We, we go through and spend a lot of time trying to understand the data and ask questions about it. I think in the process of doing that, you know, the dashboard has functionality where you can slice and dice the, the data different ways. Um, we have made tweaks to it as part of that process, and so I think that that has been working well. Um, I think that in our new role as liaisons or whatever our title is, um, we, we'd like to keep doing that um, so that we can do a bit more of a deeper dive on a more regular basis. And along those lines, I would encourage anybody who sees or thinks there's data that they would like on the dashboard that isn't there to get that information to us so we can adjust it as we move forward. Okay. Thank you very much. And I should end just by saying a big thanks to Araya, which is the group that created the dashboard. Yeah. You're here on that. That takes us to our next agenda item, if there are no further questions. Before I move on to that, uh, I do want to uh, recognize that we have at least one member of the public who is watching, and we certainly appreciate that and, and encourage that. Um, I believe that person has indicated a desire to speak. I, I just want to clarify for everyone that public comment uh, for this meeting has already taken place, um, and so I won't be recognizing uh, folks who are, or got their hand raised don't mean any disrespect for that. We just need to keep uh, things moving and make sure everyone has the same opportunity to speak um, and address the board. So anything else? I think we're good. 706, is that right? No, 707, the case processing standards. Uh, Mr. Cardona and Ms. Yang, welcome back. Thanks. And if we can get the PowerPoint up, I think Ms. Zhang is going to take the first part of this. All right. 
So I heard the discussion of the previous agenda item. A lot of discussions we probably will touch uh, again in this presentation. Uh, we really mean to have a good discussion before we wrap up the final proposal for SB211 uh, case processing standards. Uh, and again, the timeline is October 31st. We need to submit, uh, submit the formal proposal. So this will be the last presentation we give uh, in terms of uh, this uh, proposal. Next slide, please. So to, uh, a little bit of refresh of the memory. And also I realized uh, in the past, we gave this presentation about SB211 case positive standards de development work to RAD Regulation and Discipline Committee. So I'm not sure all board members have uh, reviewed or uh, are familiar with the work. So just to review the requirements here, four factors are required to be considered in our case processing standards, mechanics of the discipline process, complexity, risk to public uh, protection, reasonable expectations of the public. The next slide, please. In addition to those four factors, SB211 also directs us to consider those areas that standards must reflect. Uh, consultation with uh, state and national experts, review reports uh, from the legislative uh, analyst's office, and the reports from the state auditor office, uh, review of case process, processing standards in other states. I just wanna highlight here, uh, the, the, the intention we interpret here is not only we propose what we think are reasonable and ideal standards for case processing, we also want to highlight what we think, what needs to be done to meet those standards. So this pro pro proposal is about 100 page long, and the goal is, you know, you, quoting, I believe, trustee, uh, um, um, Manani said, knowledge is powerful. We did a lot of research based on all those um, uh, methodological sort of requirements, and we shared our learning points in our proposal. The next slide, please. So in May, uh, we presented about our uh, review of LAO and auditor reports, six states comparison, public survey results, in July, we presented um, about the review of ABA, American Bar Association State Comparison Data, uh, experts' opinions, and the uh, focus group results. Focus group are uh, the focus group of OCTC staff members. Now, this presentation, we will uh, 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 present about the case processing standards and the backlog metric. Um, and we will also share the public comments on those standards and the backlog metrics. And we have some questions for, for the board. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, this table summarizes, I would say the core of our standards and the backlog metrics. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a framework of uh, six case categories. So that's related with Trustee Arnold, your question, you know, when you talk about case closure, what do you mean? Case closure in intake, uh, case dismissal in, invest, uh, in, uh, in uh, intake or case closure after investigation or case closure means filing. Uh, uh, so we differentiate that in our case category and we apply different standards to different uh, case ca category here. For example, if you look at if you look at the column two proposed standard based on average, uh, it means we propose that cases that are dismissed in intake uh, should be should uh, on average uh, it should only take thirty days instead of forty two days, which is our current case uh, closure speed in intake stage. Then we have different uh, proposed average time for different categories, uh, including you know, 300 days, which uh, is a significant progress if you look at our current speed for charging, for cases that go to the, go to the stage of charging. So I, I want to pause here, any questions about the standards? The standards are based on average because um, most of the states, they report their average case processing time, so we can compare uh, uh, California's data against their uh, 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 time standards. Also, um, the agencies 
under the purview of the uh, California Department of Consumer Affairs. They use average uh, too, so it, it, it's good for us to use our average of standards to compare uh, our case processing speed uh, uh, against their data. Then the next two columns is, uh, they are specifically about backlog. We talked a lot about um, backlog, current, cur current backlog definition is 180 days for non-complex cases, 365 days for complex cases. And our current annual discipline report, the data are based on this definition. What we propose, which is the fourth column, the last column, is that only 10% of cases, a small percentage of cases, uh, quote, quoted by SBT 11, 10% of cases go beyond the target we set at, uh, at the back uh, as a backlog metric. So you can see the target actually is the average plus 150% of the average. So 30 plus 15, 45 days, 120 plus 60, 180 days. So look at the la last column and you can see most of them uh, fall uh, within 365 days. Uh, but the cases that will go to charging stage, which is about 4% of our uh, annual complaints, 4% of cases will go, usually go to charging stage. Uh, our backlog metric uh, is 450 days. It's more than a year. Uh, not Maybe not ideal enough, but if you look at our current speed, 90th percentile uh, for the current uh, case processing da data, it's almost three years, 1,126 days. And you see the proposal, the, the, the target we set in the proposal, you can see the, 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 the significant uh, improvement uh, of the case processing uh, speed here. So any questions about standards uh, based on average and target based on uh, uh, 90th percentile? Yes, thank you, Ms. Yang. We do have a couple of questions here in the room. I'll start with Trustee Selig. Mm -hmm. So thanks for this presentation and all the work that has gone into it. So I have two questions. One's simple and one is uh, harder. Um, what does RPP stand for? Risk to public protection, which ah. is the phrase that the statute uses. I see. Right. Okay. And with that, it how would we operationalize that? Is that the, the case priority number one, two, three, or something else? Uh, we would, well, we would, yes, essentially our, our P1 cases, what is currently our P1 cases, we would tweak those criteria, which are largely based on risk to define what we view as higher risk to public protection cases. Okay. We would add some factors in accordance with some suggestions from SB 211 to uh, try and get risk based not only on kind of the nature of the case itself, but also on recidivism and potentially redefine some of those risk factors to try and pick up more of our high risk cases. Right now, our P1 category is um, artificially limited because we're trying to prioritize with our limited staff. So it's capped at roughly 20% of the cases that actually go to investigation. We would eliminate that as a, as a basis for picking the criteria and try to just identify higher risk cases regardless of how many are identified that way. I see. Oh, so that's interesting. So the new system of assessing the risk profile, it would include the recidivist, potential recidivity risk of the respondent. Is that right? Yeah, we, we try to do that now with some measures, but we would likely add some additional measures. I see. Okay. That's, well, that's good. Uh, that's great. Um, so then my next question is about the proposed backlog metric, and um, I, I'm a little unsure of this, n why we would make the, me the metric 150% of the standard. I mean, it seems like if we're proposing a standard, that would be the test for, that would be the performance test. So that's one. And two, we really have so sort of two squishy wiggle room items in the proposed backlog metric, which is first it's measuring the 90th percentile, which I think is reasonable because that takes account of the outlying cases that are unusually complex or delayed, and so it doesn't, we don't have the skewed average. So I think the 90th percentile is fair enough, but why not make the backlog metric the proposed standard and measuring at the 90th percentile? So can I suggest we put that question off until some later slides where we try to explain this and pose oh. exactly the question that you were asking sure, um, in light no of some additional information? Yep. 
Sounds good. Trustee Tony has a question so far. I like this a great deal. Um, it's very clear. I'll tell you what I understand and what I don't understand, or what's easier for me to understand and harder. So it's easier for me to understand how this is, um, how this can be applied as a new set of metrics for new cases coming in, fresh in the door. I'm having a harder time understanding how you would integrate current cases, many of which already fail to meet the new standards because they're old cases. So help me understand that integration or are you gonna have like a parallel for a while? So just help me understand. Yeah, so we would, I mean, we would just adopt this case and start reporting as both new cases and older cases and simply accept the fact that for some of the older cases for some period of time, we would have a number of cases that already exceed this that we would try to work down and over time get to a point where we would be back with basically using these for the new standards. But we would accept the fact that there's going to be some clump of cases okay. that are going to have to move through the system that would be in backlog basically from the time we adopt this. Okay. Well, my, my question or request would be when we are discussing the actual adoption, if you would give us an idea of what to expect at the beginning in terms of backlog numbers, like how would the new backlog numbers look compared to the old backlog numbers with this new, so that we're at least prepared for that. And we're not surprised at a later report when we see whatever the backlog numbers are. That's my only request, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Shang, please, please continue. Okay, I, I do want to um, address a little bit more about um, um mark's question um how we can report the data so that uh, so it's good that you know adr and ctc dashboard and this presentation all go together so because adr as we said it's going to be a transitional year not only about which year you know fiscal or calendar year but also we said in the adr narrative we know after the case problems processing standards are approved if approved uh, we will need to redesign the ADR reporting a little bit. That, that's number one. Another thing is uh, right now, um, 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 all the ADR reporting are five-year trend data. So you won't see you know, the ADR reporting, uh, one, one backlog metric, then switch to another year, you use, we use another backlog metric. It will always be old backlog metric, five-year data new backlog metric five-year data. So the data definition will be consistent uh, in, in one table. So just, just to clarify that. Thank you, that's um, very helpful actually. Ms. Sheng, I'm sorry, uh, are you done with that piece of your explanation? Because I have an additional question slash comment. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much. So on this slide, um, we take us through it from intake through charging and um, we're dealing with the new statutory framework of risk to public protection. Mm -hmm. getting, getting used to that um, as a new uh, standard or metric. And I will suggest, and I will tell you that as a board member and as a chair of the board of trustees, I am increasingly getting um, more communications from members of the public or complainants um, that essentially sound like, hey, I don't hear back from the state bar. I, I've submitted a complaint, I don't hear back, I don't hear back. Um, and it strikes me that part of public protection is building and instilling or solidifying the confidence that complainants and members of the public have in our agency as uh, an effective regulator, investigator, discipliner, ultimately. Can you tell me, generally speaking, how much communication goes back to a complainant between the intake phase and the charging phase? I'm assuming we're not gonna go 450 days to a charging uh, situation where the complainant hasn't heard from us or isn't interacting with us or our investigator. Generally speaking, where does the communication happen? I think George is at a better position to answer this question, but I will go back to the risk factor a little bit more. George, you want to answer first? Sure, so the once a case moves to, an invest, moves to investigation, uh, the complainant is notified of that. 
Um, and then basically after that, if the complainant requests a status update, we give them a status update. Um, and if the complainant has questions, we answer those questions. Um, I would just remind um, the board that we did include in the 2022 budget the, the ombuds, which is called a public trust liaison. The public trust liaison has been hired, someone from George's uh, office, a really a wonderful candidate who used to started off answering the phones in OCTC, so direct customer um, uh, interaction and became an investigator, then uh, passed the bar, became an attorney in OCTC. And thank you so much, um, Melanie, for participating in that uh, selection process. So part of the impetus for creating this position is just precisely the kind of feedback that you're talking about. Um, it's not a perfect solution, obviously. Um, what would be better is if within OCTC there were more uh, systematic approaches for proactive communication with complainants. But we will have an avenue in-house for um, making sure people get followed up with one way or the other. Thank you. And, and I recognize, Mr. Cardona, that it's the vast majority of complainants understand the process and sort of follow and track along, but there are always going to be a certain number who, for whatever reason, have a harder time you know, waiting to hear back. Understand, there are also a certain number of complainants who have received communications and nevertheless complain. <laughs> but I, I take the point, we will look at seeing if we can do some kind of uh, more regularly, perhaps a quarterly update to complainants whose cases are, are pending an investigation. Great, thank you so much. Okay, Ms. Shang. Thanks. I, I just want to um, uh, go back, uh, not go back, but talk a little bit about, um, you know, this proposal, the intention of this proposal. Uh, again, I said it's 100 page long. It's not, a, I mean, if, if this table can explain all, it doesn't deserve 100 page long. But we collected a lot of information and feedback, including the focus groups I, ju I just talked about. Uh, OCETC 65 staff members participated in five focus groups. They provided a lot of detailed feedback, how we could improve the procedures and operation. I know George has reviewed them all. And uh, in the, at the end of the proposal, as part of the staffing needs analysis, we said we will all also make a plan to follow up with all the feedback and suggestions. So there, there will be you know, two lines of work. One is we ask for resources because you can see it is a significant you know, improvement based on what's happening right now and what we aim to do. Uh, another thing is that we, we do realize there's a lot that can be done in terms of our internal operation and the procedures. And that's part of the proposal development work too. Um, okay, that's it. Next slide. So public comments, we posted uh, the standards and the backlog metric with some background information uh, uh, for six weeks to solicit public comments. Um, only 22 responses. And this is the you know, disaggregated data for those 22 responses. So the general mood is that agree, you know, six agree if modified. The general mood is that uh, it's a good effort uh, if, you know, all those agree if modified, the, the general sentiment is, can you do it even faster? Um, you know, like, you know, especially for those 450 days of, uh, or 300 days for charging average, uh, the average case processing time. Uh, the disagree three are there, they're all attorneys. So we can look at the attorney responses and the non-attorney responses uh, separately. Okay. Next slide, please. Ms. Uh, Shang, Trustee Seleg has a question. So okay. Other than, I assume most of the disagreement is uh, that the timelines are too long, but is there anything else in the comment? Like, what do the three attorneys say, disagree about? Do they want it to be, I mean. Uh, <laughs> they just uh, kind of a deep sense of distrust. They, they feel it's not, you know, it's, it's not going to change anything. Mo mostly this kind of sentiment there. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah, not, not specific suggestion. 
Got it. Yeah, yeah. Next one, please. So um, our general takeaways is that, you know, as I said, overall support for shorter time standards, uh, still not fast enough. Um, concern about harm to clients when action by state bar is delayed. Um, need to ensure that repeat offenders are caught and receive more severe discipline. I want to talk a little bit about that. That's directly related with the indicator risk indicator we talked about. The reason we, we, we don't use the term risk, we use the term risk to public protection. Also, the, you know, directly quote the SB211 language. That includes um, multiple um, uh, complaints against the same attorney. So we, we would like to sh uh, ensure that our definition of risk to public protection uh, uh, can you know um, at least reflect such concern both from the legislature and from the public. And right now we uh, just finished designing uh, a dashboard that uh, the state uh, the OCTC intake staff members can go to the dashboard, uh, and, uh, input the uh, the the. Um, uh, bar number, and they will immediately see all the previous uh, complaints uh, against that attorney. So we are we are we are doing some work uh, to address this concern. Uh, another thing is that um, we have developed a thread of work to respond to state auditors' recommendations. Uh, while reading the comments, I I realize some of the public members are not aware. Of the work we do, including this, you know, the huge concern about repeat offenders. So I think there's gap uh, um, between, uh, you know, our what we do here and communicate that uh, with the, uh, to the public. And again, that lose, uh, lose back to Leah's, you know, uh, point about that public uh, trust liaison position. So those those are our takeaways. Next slide, please. All right, George, please. Sure. So this is uh, relating to Sean's question about the backlog metrics. Um, so as you know, our current metrics and non-complex cases, we are supposed to close or file those within six months, complex cases within 12 months. Um, our current proposal defines case processing standards based on an average time to close, um, and that's based on our data and also to make our standards comparative to reporting to the ABA and what most other states use. Um, the backlog metrics are something other than that. So to kind of see uh, what we're doing here, we're actually trying to improve in two different areas. So we have an average, which is basically the peak, which we are trying to bring down so that the time taken for an average case goes significantly down. Right now, the spread of our cases around that average is also an exceptionally broad spread with, as you can see in the black curve, a large number of cases taking a very long period of time. So in addition to bringing the peak down, the average time down, we're also looking to bring the 90th percentile time down and use that reduced 90th percentile time as the backlog metric. Oh, and so that's the theory behind two different ones. And Sean, to answer your question, if we were going to use the average, the average is basically the point in time where approximately 50% of cases are on either side of the average, um, approximately. And that's going to be skewed depending on the spread um, and the values, but approximately. Using that as a backlog measure would be very difficult because our expectation based on all the data we've looked at and the kind of reasonable times that cases take just to do the things that are necessary would suggest that a large number of cases, roughly 50%, would typically fall outside that average. Um, and so the goal is to pick a backlog metric that's a reasonable goal for a spread of time values such that no more than 10% would be above that 90th percentile, and that's the backlog measure. So that's why there are two numbers, um, and that, in fact, is hopefully on our next question. Oh. Yes. Can, can, may I ask about the, is it okay if I ask about the, the, pri the chart you just showed, George? Sure. So I think I'm being slow. I don't understand this. So I understand what you're saying about an average. I mean, you could use a median instead that would help. Correct. Help with that problem. But um, why? 
Oh, I, mis I, I was reading it backwards. So the idealized is the red. That's what yes, you want. Yes, so the to idealized target. one is the red. Um, so as you can see, so our, our current data is the black line to the right, um, where our actual 90th percentile based on our current spread is 1,126 cases. Okay. I get We're I was trying reading to significantly it narrow yeah. that so that our 90th percentile falls at a much lower number. I see. I understand. And then, um, but maybe you're going to get to this. I still don't understand using 150% of the proposed standard to be the backlog measure. So that's that idealized curve. In other words, it's, you know, we, we picked that as uh, something that we thought was a sufficiently narrow curve to decrease the spread significantly. So that's basically 150%. It was, it was an artificial choice to come up with a idealized narrow curve um, that's much closer to around the average. But George, I think what he's asking is actually addressed in the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's some of the options. Um, so right now what's being, there's a number of things that could be options. One, we could just take the average case processing time as the standard, um, and it, the goal would be no more than 50% of cases are beyond that. Um, that doesn't seem to mesh with the legislature's direction that there only be a small number of cases in backlog. So option two, we could just generate the idealized 90th percentile, 150% of average time as the only goal, and no more than 10% of cases would close beyond, would be our goal. Option three would be what we're actually proposing is to have two numbers, which would be more transparent. In other words, we would report both the average, and we would have a goal of maintaining an average at that level, and a second goal of having no more than 10% of cases be outside the uh, backlog metric set at 150% of average time. So these are kind of the three options. Our proposal is um, option three. And there, you know, there are a number of things that you could think about in terms of this. Um, you know, we've selected 150% of the time, um, basically across all the categories, um, to basically reflect a narrowing of the curve to an idealized curve. You could change that. Um, in other words, you could say, we don't think 150% is appropriate, or we don't think 150% is appropriate for certain of the categories. We want you to have a goal of making that even narrower. Um, that will ultimately impact the staffing study. Um, you know, if you say, for example, in charging, you wanted to um, say, okay, we think it should be 110%. Um, so that the backlog measure should be 330 days instead of 450. Um, I think that would be very difficult for us to meet. Um, it's well under the current 365 days for complex cases, which is roughly most of the cases that end up in charging. Most of those are complex. Um, but you could say that, um, and that would then be reflected in staffing. My strong suggestion would be that you not set a backlog target that's below 365 days, because I think that would be incredibly difficult for us to meet and would be kind of inconsistent with our current statutory goal. But that's one of the options for you, is to say, we think that number 450 is too high, we think it should be lower, um, and we could take that as the goal, um, and that would then be reflected in the staffing standards. If I may, I'd like to draw a bridge between our previous conversation on the dashboard and Trustee Shelby's, I think, very good suggestion that we spend some time um, interfacing with legislative staff on the dashboard and sort of how to use it and and the, the power behind the analysis and the numbers um, and, and maybe uh, previewing some of what we're talking about here because I think as, as Sean demonstrated, and, I, and I'm feeling these are, these are uh, new ways of looking at numbers, certainly the standards are for us to, st to set, but I would like to know um, that there is some co communication happening with stakeholders to see that they likewise understand this proposed regime, for lack of a better word, um, and we could receive input before we actually make the decision on on the new standards. I, I don't know whether that's a fair thing to say because I understand the legislature has given us the directive to come up with standards, but I would, um, if it's possible to uh, work on a common language before we adopt the standards, I think that that would go 
a long way in moving us sort of through the next phase of how we report and, and how we get judged. What we, what we are doing is UN has once, and then now I think the goal is after today, next week, for the second time, shared uh, the proposal as it's being developed with the Legislative Analyst Office. And the Legislative Analyst Office is uh, the, the one identified in statute who we actually have to submit the standards to, who will be evaluating the standards. That being said, I think it makes sense to do, um, try to do a preview with at least legislative uh, judiciary committee staff. And, and, I, and I do wanna just take this as an opportunity to say, I think George's position and probably Ewing's is option three. I don't share that view. I don't think it's politically wise for us to have a, ca a case processing time and then a backlog goal that is distinct and is uh, gives us much more time. I don't think that's politically wise for us. And I think where you were going, Sean, is what where I am, which is actually option two, that your 90th percentile is actually your case processing standard. I think that's what you were saying, Sean, as opposed to having two different measures, just having one and setting it at that 90th percentile. Um, yeah. And then, you know, setting aside this question of is 450 days in charging too long, that's, that's a separate discussion. But I just wanted to clarify, I see some risk in having two different numbers. And I'm sorry, remind me again of the deadline for us to, to make these calls. So ideally, you would make this call as to which of these options you prefer today, <laughs> so that we can then, because that's going to require some major adjustments in um, in our report and the derivation. Okay. This is due October 31st, along with the ADR and the special meeting that's being set in October. You'll receive both, uh, hopefully, well, not hopefully, you will receive both reports well in advance so that you can actually read them before the meeting. So we we don't have that much time at but, this point to work with. But what I, what I think I hear George saying is uh, it's going to be very difficult to prepare those reports um, without direction on one of these Op three options today. Did you want to respond to that? And I know Sean had something to say as well. I mean, I'll let Ewen weigh in, but yes, my belief is that we need at least some guidance um, because if we are going to put the final report together, you know, we need to know what we're <laughs> what we're reporting on. Sure. Right. I, I just want to say the proposal, the step, the the proposal is mostly done based on the assumption. Again, that's why we want this discussion. Uh, um, uh, um, we we we. We based our proposal on option three, as, as Ria mentioned. Um, we, we are open-minded. That's why we want the board's uh, involvement at this stage. Uh, we are also gonna run the report with the legislative analyst office. Um, one more thing is that option two is clean. You know, one number, one target. Uh, the reason um, I just speak for myself, I'm a little reluctant to option two is that the public, when they look at option one, as we say in our you know, a post for, uh, for public comments, option one is other standards. They, they still feel they're not fast enough. So I, I, I just feel like we're, well, if we post you know, uh, option two as our standards and the targets, I just feel that 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 sentiment will will be even stronger because it, it is 150 percent of option one uh, numbers uh, right now. That's number one uh, motivation for for me to kind of uh, uh, advocate for option three. Another motivation is that um, um, we did a lot of state analysis, especially George did some deep dive uh, at this at other states. ABA they report. Every state reports average, average this, average that, average this. So we, it's much easier for us to compare, uh, compare our data against their data. So that's another motivation there. That, that's it, go ahead. So if, if I can add two things. One, obviously we could still derive our average as we go forward and we could compare our average case data to other states, even if we picked one number. Um, I, I understand the desire to have just one number, but 
if you look at it this way, um, another way of looking at this is if our goal is to maintain an average in a certain number, um, the second number is not that same goal. It's then defining what it means to be in backlog. Um, and so if you look at it that way, there's some sense to having two different numbers. One is our goal, which is we want to maintain an average of this number for our cases. Um, and then two, we're going to define as backlog this. Um, and that seems to be somewhat consistent with the legislative direction, um, which is case processing standards such that only a small number of cases will be in backlog. Um, but that said, um, you can choose either way. If, if you choose option two, my guess would be that we would still report our average case time so that we would have something that would be comparable to um, the other states and we could look at how we were doing in comparison to the other states. Okay, we've got several hands up. Uh, Sean was first, then Greg Knoll online, and then um, Jose. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I th so I think of these options, I, I prefer option two, but let me, I mean, the reason is I think having these two standards, it indicates a lack of commitment to success, right? So if we're gonna say this is the standard for our case processing, but then we say we're not committing to meeting that, we're committing to meeting 150%, it just, that just, it, it's part of this is just messaging, but um, to me, I think if you were to have an additional metric, it would be that based on that curve you showed, right, that, that there's some percentage of cases that you're anticipating um, completing more quickly, and then some are good, you know, anyway, I, I think you could have an aspirational standard to achieve whatever it's going to be, you know, faster because a lot of the cases can be resolved more quickly and then you have the problem of the more complicated cases driving the average up. So that's one comment. The other is I'm not sure why we wouldn't look to the median because we do have the problem of very difficult complex cases, you know, skewing the average. And of course we can report lots of different numbers but I guess we have to settle on one metric for this purpose. So. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Thanks, Sean. Greg, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, believe that option two is the easiest, the cleanest to explain and to the public as well as to uh, legislative folks. Um, I, I'm a little concerned about one when you say that you're going to, you anticipate right off the bat that 50% of the, of the cases you have are not going to meet the goal. Um, and, and three, I think, is going to be met with uh, what? But that's why uh, I think option two is, is the best. And I also uh, want to, sorry about that. Uh, I also want to uh, support what both uh, Ruben and Leah said that we really need, when this is, when this is finalized, when it's finished um, and we approve it, we need to take this right to the uh, staff uh, of some of the legislators and, and, and make sure they understand it. And they'll, they'll let us know what they don't understand, which is likely you know, what they think their boss will not understand. Because you want to make this we want to keep this as simple and straightforward, I think, as possible. And that's really the beauty of option two. Now, it may be difficult, but it's, it's the one that, that everyone will understand. Um, anyway, that's my view. Thank you, Greg. Jose, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not not committed yet to any particular option, but I do just have a question and I apologize if this has already been covered or something that, that um, isn't quite important here. 
you've stated earlier that um, when we look at this chart and we look at all six of these measures, they look equal. But I think you said 90% of the cases are in number one, line one, and they trickle down to smaller amounts as we go through the levels. Would it not be important or is it not allowed under SP 211 to weight levels one through six? So one, so something like, I mean, even the worst case, if 90% of the cases are in level one, 90% of all the complaints are done in whatever, well less than 180 days. And the average across all six lines is far less than 450 days That's or correct. any measure. So is there a way to, I mean, right now this looks daunting because I glance, I zoom past one, two, and three, and I focus on th four, five, and six because they all look equal, but they're not, right? That's correct. I mean, roughly at any given time, roughly between 75 and 90% of the cases are closing an intake. Um, and only 4% of cases are ending up in charging. So we could take any of these columns, option one or two, or any of those stacks, and once we multiply them by the number of cases on each of those lines, we could then calculate across the entire universe of complaints, how long did it take? Yes, so we, we could do a, so for example, we could take 90% times um, 30 days or 45 right. days right? Um, and 4% times 450 days and come up with an overall target. And did the legislature ask us to look at our entire universe of complaints or did it say be sure to itemize it down to a discrete level and type and make sure that every single type or is it something like I'm looking at your entire universe of, of complaints you receive and I want to see a standard for that. Based on the conversation that Ewen had with the legislative analyst's office, there is a desire to have one backlog number, um, and we would report one backlog number. In other words, the way we would report would be we would take the number or the percentage of cases meeting goals in each case and add that up. So at the bottom, you'll see the total, which would be the sum of the numbers not meeting the backlog target in each category summed up to give us the overall uh, backlog number. That backlog number overall would reflect the number of cases in each category. Um, so that would, in effect, be taken into account in reporting on the backlog. So I wonder if, in this conversation, or the one, the decision we have to make by the end of October, if it would be useful to look at some of these scenarios and do that, undertake that last step you just described, because I don't see that added up one backlog number under any of these columns for all six, or am I missing it? Okay, I, I, I just want to weigh in with probably a little bit more data. Um, for intake uh, average four-year data, 64% uh, closed or dismissed in intake, 64%. From two to five, category two to five, which, in, which is investigation, it's 32%. It's based on four-year average. Charging based on, on four-year average is 4%. Uh, we did aggregate uh, the cases, you know, based on the based on the weight uh, as you suggested. Um, it's about 166, or I, I think it's 162 or 166 days for cases closed in investigation, which is 32 percent. So we can we can have the total number, which I think is a great idea. Uh, and we also proposed in our standards said we can aggregate them to report in our annual discipline report. You know, uh, we have the table, then we have the total as we have shown here. So that, that will definitely bring the number down. It will be below 360 for, for sure. Uh, will be close to 100, uh, will be around 180 days. Uh, uh, it should be low. But, but another thing is, another tricky thing is, um, that's based on cur his current data. Our definition for high risk, uh, as George said, has been uh, changed based on the you know, SB211 requirements and feedback we have received, received from all those experts. So the higher risk, the, the percentage, we don't know yet. 
we, we, we haven't you know, processed our, state, our cases based on the new definition. So the wait here will be temporary. So, so that, mean, that, that means you know, we expect our way today, the, the reported documented in the proposal, we'll have some adjustment when, when we really look at the cases, apply new definitions, both uh, risk to public protection and complexity. Uh, hopefully not just drastic you know, change, but there will be some change. But I still think it's worth to uh, have, the one, have one number based on the current data. Certainly uh, a lot to digest and think about. And I, I appreciate uh, both of your uh, thoroughness in answering the questions and engaging in the dialogue. Let me just uh, do a housekeeping check in. It's 1030, we've been going since nine. I've actually been going since eight at a prior meeting. Um, is there, how much more do you have in your presentation? And then maybe after the presentation, we'll take a very quick bio break and then come back for a discussion. Sure, so let me go to the, so that's one question, which I think everybody understands. Next question is how to deal with abated cases. Um, so there are cases, um, currently we abate investigations under a number of conditions that are laid out there. Um, the most frequent is when there is a pending civil or criminal case that poses similar material issues and we abate our disciplinary investigation to await the resolution of those issues in the civil or criminal case. That's the most common. Um, so our proposal is that we continue our abatement practices and we might tweak that slightly in response to some comments from one of the experts to take into account situations where we might not abate as much while a case is on appeal if it's been resolved at the hearing stage. We would exclude the time that a case spends in abatement from the application of the case processing standards, but for transparency, we would report on abated cases in the ADR. Um, so there would be an, a, an ability to see which cases have been abated um, and for how long, um, but that would not count towards. So for example, if we abated a case in investigation because of a pending civil litigation for, let's say, 180 days, that 180 days while the case was in suspense, while our action on it was deferred, would not count towards the case processing standards. That's incorporated in our proposal. Um, and. In the past, the public uh, complainants have not liked this. They have not liked us putting their disciplinary investigations on hold. There are, I think, very valid reasons for doing that. We don't want to interfere with the ongoing proceeding. Um, we don't want to potentially reach a conclusion contrary to the court that is in a closer position to those issues and arguably has many more me mechanisms for getting information. Um, so there are valid reasons for doing that, but you should know that we have received criticism from complainants um, and it has been the subject of some concern. Um, and so second question is, does this proposal cause concerns? Do you want us to do something different um, with abatement? And some of the alternatives are we could um, continue to count the time in the application of the case processing standards. Um, this would result in showing some cases taking well outside the case processing standards because in effect we've deferred our action for some period of time, but we could do that. Or we could take a much more strict approach to abatement and simply not abate as many cases and in particular not abate as many cases based on pending civil, criminal, or administrative proceedings. That poses the issues I just addressed in terms of uh, potential conflicts with the outcome in the civil or criminal case and potential interference with the civil or criminal case. Trustee Chen, please. Um, George, if you wouldn't mind going back to the previous slide, I have a question about, I understand how abatement in scenario two in the left-hand column mm -hmm. prevents their, you know, avoids there being conflicting decisions. But scenario one strikes me as a situation where there could be two different complaints about the same attorney involving two totally different sets of conduct or you know, alleged incidents of wrongdoing, in which case you wouldn't have duplicative investigations or decisions. That's true. The, the first one is basically if we have a case that we believe is strong and likely to result in disbarment, we basically focus our resources on that and hold off on other cases relating to that same attorney. Um, that's a resource question. We simply, in other words, we're not gonna waste time investigating these three additional complaints where we have these complaints that we think are likely to lead to disbarment because then the attorney will be out of circulation. 
So that raises for me a, a, an interesting question about communication with the complainant on that second case, right? Because statutorily, we can't discuss with the second complainant the status of the investigation on the first complaint that's likely to result in serious discipline. Um, so we have a complainant who's left with only hearing that they're either their case is not being investigated or has been abated. Is that, are those the two options? Yes, we typically let that complainant know that we have abated. We, we're holding their case, uh, we're deferring their case uh, pending another matter. Yeah. <laughs> it's thoroughly unsatisfying. Yeah, if I could react, I mean, I, I, under, I can understand the reason why you would do that to focus your resources most efficiently and if, you know, the ultimate goal is to just get this person disbarred so that they can't practice law anymore. You, but you would see how the second complainant could feel like, well, I, I'm totally not being heard or, you know, this thing that, terrible thing that I'm saying happened to me is just being ignored. Um, I wonder if there's just a different way to go about doing it in, in addition to communicating. And, and then also, I guess I would wonder whether there's circumstances where even, you know, even if we think the state bar court is likely to recommend disbarment and disbarment ultimately doesn't happen, is it important then to have a belt and suspenders approach where you've got this other complaint? Yeah, so I mean, typically if we, I mean, typically, so let's say we have an attorney who has um, 15 complaints. Um, we will try and identify the three or four that we think are the strongest and work on those three or four and put the other 11 on hold. Um, I don't think <laughs> we, should, we should change that and work on all 15 because that would basically be you know, taking resources that are really going towards something that is not going to accomplish something at the end of the day. The issue is, I think, one more of communication um, in which we are limited by the statute that precludes us from, in most instances, disclosing um, that we're engaged in an investigation of another complaint. So, you know, I think there are two different pieces here. I would strongly argue in favor of maintaining the abatement process um, and then working on the communication piece um, rather than abandoning the abatement process because of the communication issue. I know we have talked about this, Jose and I have talked about this separately with you. The term abatement, I also think, contributes to a lot of misperceptions. Abatement sounds like you're, it's like a tax abatement, like you're making it go away, as opposed to we are taking this seriously and doing something about it. It's putting it on hold, essentially. So we are, we could use the term deferral. Um, I'm not sure if that's any better. I'm open to terminology suggestions. Um, we use abatement because that's the word that's used in the rules relating to when the state bar abates cases, and so there's a parallelism there. Um, but I'm open to other terms if uh, anyone has any suggestions. Vice Chair Stallings has a question or a comment. This doesn't necessarily go towards the abatement issue, but um, when you're talking about investigating the maybe like the most serious misconduct and utilizing your resources, how much uh, does a potential victims, uh, financial um, risk, you know, as far as financial loss, how much does that factor into where you spend your resources and what cases are investigated? I mean, that would be a factor that we'd consider in assessing the seriousness, so that weighs into harm, and so if we have a, for example, a client who has suffered an actual loss um, that hasn't been compensated, that would be something that we would factor in in assessing which of those cases to proceed on, and that would typically be one we'd proceed on. And I guess I just want to make sure that there's not a policy in place that would have the effect, what, um, the unintended effect of making sure that uh, a complainant would not be, um, you know, reimbursed through the client security yeah. fund. And, you know, there's something that might hurt their chances of being put whole. So I just want to make sure that there's not that, that policy in place. Yeah, we would, we would not do something that would cause someone to be in a worse position in seeking reimbursement. Great, thank you. Trustee Broughton has a question or a comment. I do. In the criminal context, we don't necessarily abate the less serious cases. They trail along, we call it, so that you're handling the more serious cases, but the other ones are still active and they're going right along with it. I don't know how you would 
categorize it, but um, that is a different term that, that tells the world, if you will, that these cases aren't not being handled, but they're being handled along with the more serious cases. And I guess I have another question is that, let's say you're out of your 15 cases that you, in your hypothetical, um, you handle your three or four cases and now those cases are resolved and you've gotten your uh, disbarment or whatever happened to be. Do you now reactivate those trailing cases or the abated cases to now handle them individually? Or are they somehow incorporated into the cases that you've now adjudicated? I mean, how does how does that work? Or, or do they get dismissed, let's say, as you went to criminal context? Yeah, so typically we would close those cases. In other words, if we if we had 15 cases, we decided to precise it on four. As a result of those four, we got either disbarment or a lengthy suspension that we believed was the appropriate um, action for that attorney. Um, we would simply close those other cases. I don't know how you account for that, but you know, sort of going on with what I understood um, uh, Brandon's question to be. Um, if those people on those abated cases, let's say had issues with um, uh, the client security fund, would, would their losses, if you will, be incorporated into the three cases that were adjudicated or do they, they have to do it separately? How would that work? So we would, we would make sure that when we were doing that, there would still be the ability to recover from the client security fund for any people who had suffered actual losses. And I would, have to, I would have to get back to you on how exactly we do that, but we do do that. If you dismiss the cases because they, uh, you've adjudicated the more serious ones, you don't want those people uh, that have had abated cases not to get some quote unquote justice. Correct. Thank you, Trustee Broughton. Uh, Trustee Seleg. Um, so I think it's very fair to uh, exclude the abated cases from the calculation because we've seen how that skews the results in the past. Um, uh, what was my question? Um, well, it, so it takes me back to the, 10, the 90th percentile. So I had made an assumption, which is, turns out not to be true, that the part of the rationale for that was the problem with abated cases skewing the statistics. So what is the 10 percent, what is just excluding the slowest 10 percent of the cases, like what's the theory behind that, behind selecting the 90th percentile? So the 90th percentile was selected because that is typically a statistical measure that's used to identify cases that are outside the norm, in other words, the true outliers. Um, and so when we look at our actual historical curve over the last four years, we see you know, that 10% at the far end that truly are outliers. Um, and so the concept was, okay, we accept that you know, nobody wants us to have that broad a curve with outliers lying that far out. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do is say, okay, secondary goal is we're going to narrow the curve so that even our outliers are much closer to the average. Um, and so that would be the 10%. Yeah. I guess this is kind of a broad question and uh, this may need some follow-up, but um, given the numbers in the chart, right, for the proposed standards, which are uh, at least at the 150% level are pretty, um, are not short timelines, I'm just wondering what would cause 10% of the cases to exceed that when we're excluding all the abated cases? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a good question and it's something that we're looking at in terms of can we fix procedures to do it? You know, there are some cases that take a long time to investigate. Um, you know, um, we have cases in which we have to issue multiple subpoenas to banks, gather records, um, do extensive review of those records, and sometimes investigations just take a while, um, you know, to get the appropriate interviews with witnesses, et cetera. Um, that said, there are undoubtedly um, things that are going on that, that, that we could correct in terms of those delays. And when Eileen mentioned, that's one of the other things we're looking at is, you know, changes to our procedures, changes to our practices. The other thing that is driving that in part is, I think, um, you know, the staffing needs. Um, you know, when investigators have large caseloads, 
um, they're skipping around from case to case, and sometimes some of those cases fall through the cracks um, and sit for long periods of time. And as you'll see um, in the report when we do it, you know, if you remember, one of the one of the mechanisms that, that we used in deriving these standards was to look at our cases and look at instances where there were gaps in time between investigative events that we couldn't explain. And then we derive these standards in part by saying, okay, we're gonna take every case where there's a gap of 60 days or more that can't be explained and recalculate the time, eliminating that gap on the assumption that that gap was driven by either some procedural flaw or a staffing issue. Um, and that's how we arrived at these idealized averages and 90th percentiles. Um, and so in effect, that factors in what we think are the two primary drivers, which is staffing issues such that cases sit for times that they shouldn't and potential procedural issues in terms of handling cases that make them take longer than they should. Okay, and then, I'm sorry, so last question for a while. So um, the, the numbers that you're proposing for the standards, are those, are those aspirational with more people or are those based on current funding and staffing levels? No, those are aspirational with more people. Okay. And the question then will be, which is I think our next question, is how do we arrive at what the appropriate number of people is to accomplish those aspirational okay. goals? A good segue then. Uh, and that is in fact our next uh, slide, which is the timeline for the staffing analysis. Um, so SB 211 um, says that our analysis shall include staffing requirements for the Office of Chief Trial Counsel to achieve the case processing goals described in this paragraph. Um, we're not going to be delivering the staffing needs analysis with the proposal um, for a number of reasons. One, we need to know what the standards are before we can do a staffing needs analysis based on those standards. Um, and two, um, the secondary issue is, you know, as a result of the state audit and as a result of me coming in and looking at things, um, we are in the process of kind of changing many of our procedures and practices and doing some reorganization to try and make our case processing more efficient. Um, and so that then poses um, a couple of questions for you or options for you. Um, once the case processing standards are approved, we could immediately proceed with the staffing needs analysis. Uh, the likely time frame right there, it says four to five months with a completion in or around March or April of 2023. It might actually be a little longer than that depending on when we started it um, and how we, we'd have to do some workarounds. But in other words, started immediately. Um, we would not have, if we did that, any data that accounted for changes in OCTC practices and procedures, which are currently being implemented. Option two, wait a year um, to gather data that accounts for some of the changes in practices and procedures as well. Um, so there would be a time frame for putting some of those in place, seeing what happens with the data based on those changes, and then using that updated data that incorporates at least some of those changes um, as the basis for then doing the staffing needs analysis. Um, so those are kind of the two options. Um, and uh, that is another place where we are looking for guidance in terms of doing the staffing needs analysis. Obviously option two moves us further away um, from what the legislature indicated they wanted, which was a staffing needs analysis contemporaneously with the case processing standards. Option one is closer to what the legislature suggested. Trustee Tony, and then Seleg. Um, I'd like to request to be recognized after the break. Okay. Uh, I, I'm asking for a break. Uh, I'm okay. asking to be recognized after the break. That would that would be fine uh, with me. And that is the end of the presentation. Oh, good. All right. Let's uh, reconvene at eleven o'clock, please. Convened. We are recording, Madam Secretary, or someone. There else, could you confirm that uh, our trustees who are remote are back with us? Yeah, cameras, are cameras are off, but um, let them know that we are going again. Ms. Shang, welcome back, Mr. Cardona. Okay, so thank you very much for the presentation and the um, the extensive back and forth and answering our questions. I think we have the makings of a good conversation here. So um, let me open it up to the floor and recognize Mr. Tony pursuant to his request. Thank you very much. 
Um, my comment is on the question of the three options for case processing standards. And um, I, I do want to note that the uh, ideal uh, percentage is very aggressive. The 150% of average time, that, that, that's an aggressive goal. And when you look at the shape of the curve, it's a very steep curve, right? It, 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 it doesn't look like your standard deviation, standard bell curve. It is an aggressive standard, which is fine, okay? But I just want to acknowledge that. So the first thing is I, I, I want to say that my comment for option one is that um, um, Trustee Seleg is, is correct in his notation that when it says no more than 50% of cases will close beyond that goal is a definition of median rather than average, okay? I, I'm fine with average, but in order to achieve an average, you generally have to have more than 50% of your cases closed before that deadline because of the trailing end the trailing edge of the cases that will go more than double or triple the number. So it's just a, you know, I, I, I want to acknowledge, I think average is okay, but the note here, no more than 50 close beyond the goal, it, 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 it really, it, it, it's confusing. Um, I, I, I get um, uh, Trustee Knowles' um, desire um, to have a single number um, and that there's some attractiveness to the 90th percentile being the only goal um, in option two. The reason why I support option three, though, has to do with this goal. The goals that we adopt are, don't just have a function for external purposes, but have an internal purpose. And for internal staffing goals, um, it's important for the staff to know that the deadline to process cases needs to be way beyond, way before, way prior to the 90th percentile, or else you'll never, you'll, you'll never get there. If you need 90% of your cases closed before the goal, you need a much more aggressive goal. And that's what um, option three does, okay? It both says we have aggressive goals for processing all cases. We know that not, that not every case will be, and that the backlog ones are the ones that exceed the 150% um, of the average time we're shooting for. I just think that that is the most useful, both internally and externally. And um, we, 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 it's, it's important for the board to back up George's um, uh, uh, management. And um, I, so I just want to let you know why I very much support option three. Thank you, Mr. Tony. Mr. Seleg, is your hand still proverbially raised? <laughs> it is. But if anyone else wants to be heard first, I mean, I've spoken a lot today, so but I don't see any other hands. Um, yeah, there's a lot to think about here. So, um, so George, so going back to the topic of, uh, I forget the terminology on the slide, the workload assessment or staffing, staffing, staffing assessment. So. Um, I'm just, I mean, obviously, is, I'm, not, I'm sure you share the concern, but I'm a little concerned about not meeting the, the deadline and putting it off for a year, even though I can understand um, the rationale behind that. I just wonder if there's, is there some way to do something now that's kind of on a more, like a more interim thing? Because I think we know the office needs more people and we know the cases are not being 
process as quickly as we'd like, and then there's sometimes issues with cases not being charged that should be charged and all of that stuff. So um, I just throw that out. I realize there are a lot of challenges there, and this may not be the right time, but I'm curious what changes you're making in the structure of the office, so or the operation of the office. So maybe that's for the next meeting to talk about, or if you want to do it briefly now, but we're already spending a good deal of time, so. Sure, so I'll, I'll turn to Yuin on the staffing analysis, because that's something that'll largely be driven by her office doing that. Um, in terms of changes we've made, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've shifted around our trial team so that we've increased the number of people who are handling cases that we view as investigations that can be expedited and quickly resolve cases that we think with minimal investigation can be resolved quickly to try and take those cases out of the inventory more quickly so that the balance of our investigators and attorneys can focus on the cases that we think are like more likely to move towards charging um, and or require more in-depth investigation. Um, the goal being essentially, as you've recognized, to handle the you know, to handle the 90% of our cases that are likely to resolve without charging um, and resolve those more quickly to free up resources to focus on the more serious cases that are likely to move to charging. Um, so we've taken kind of the first step towards that by essentially doubling the size of our team that is handling more expedited investigations. Okay. Um, and we're looking at other things along those same lines. Um, but, you know, I will emphasize again <laughs> that, you know, that that correcting all of this is not something that is going to be done in, in two months. It's going to take some time to implement these changes and then to see whether they accomplish what we want them to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I certainly would understand if you wanted to do a staffing needs analysis more quickly. Sure. So before we turn to Yuin, I just want to give a little bit of um, my perspective on this. Um, First of all, when we did the last workload study, one of the reasons used to uh, fund 19 positions versus the 58 positions was because the um, we were going to be implementing the Odyssey case management system. And there was this thought that there would be a number of uh, changes or efficiencies or lack of efficiencies that would result potentially from that change and that we needed to assess the impact of that case management system before uh, finalizing our staffing needs. So that's just one little data point for you. Then I believe it was the 2020 audit um, directed the state bar to study the impact of implementation of the workforce planning recommendations. These are the ones that created essentially the, the teams that we have now. With it created the supervising attorney classification, investigators, attorneys, and uh, paralegals working in that team structure. The inference in that audit was that this has actually led to inefficiencies and increased case processing time. And we were directed to assess the impact when I came back to the bar last year, we hadn't done that, and we still haven't done it. Okay, so we still haven't assessed the impact of the implementation of workforce planning reform. So that's another data point. Next one, in this uh, staff in the SB 211 report, Ewing has referred to this uh, with respect to the OCTC staff focus groups. The staff have a number of recommendations for efficiencies. This also comes through in the incognitos, and I know that George is considering all of these. But when you read the SB 211 report, this section that outlines this staff feedback, your natural question is, one, like, well, why aren't these things being done? And two, if I'm re reviewing this along with a request for more staffing, your natural reaction is, well, how do you know you need, you know, 100 new staff, because over here in this other section of your report, there's 16 different ideas for efficiencies that haven't been implemented. So when you add the ideas for efficiencies in the report as it's currently written, plus the fact that we have not done this analysis of the implementation of workforce planning reform, and the fact that the auditor had previously sort of questioned um, 
or, or held off on fully funding our staffing needs requests because of a pending operational change, be it Odyssey. When you put all that together, it suggests very strongly to me that it would be unwise for us to put forward at this time uh, a, a staffing need because I just don't think it's ripe. I think what is true and Mark, something you said earlier about when we bring this report forward to you in October, you would like to see what the backlog numbers would look like under this construction. I think what's very true is advancing these standards without corresponding staffing needs, we're essentially saying we do not have the resources to meet these standards. We know, therefore, that until we have the resources to meet these standards, we are going to be preparing ADRs and other interim reports that all show lots of red numbers, right? That That's part of what we're doing, and that has to be messaged and understood. But I think that is a, a much smarter approach. And then we do a staffing needs analysis when we can confidently say we've assessed the impact of workforce planning uh, redesign, and perhaps George will decide to change it. We've implemented many of these efficiencies that the staff doing the work have said, this is what we need to do to make things faster and to improve outcomes. Then we come back and we say, we've done all of this, and this is how many staff we need. So. I, you know, Ewing can talk about sort of how we'll, we'd actually do a staffing needs analysis. One thing I would say before I turn it over to her is um, I don't know, Sean, if we could do some like rough order of, of magnitude. It's like it's not a staffing needs analysis, but it's sort of saying, look, in moving the curve, you know, the from the black line to the red line and smashing things this way. Um, without any change in our current operational practices, we would estimate that we would need, you know, 30% more staff. I mean, maybe we can do something like that just to get in this report, you know, documentation of we absolutely will need more staff to implement this. We're just not prepared to say how much. I think that answers my question. So, I mean, feel free to, you mean to chime in more, but um, I, I do like this. The idea you had at the end there, Leah, because I hate to just not comply with the statutory demand at all, and so that is in the zone of compliance. What you just said, so the zone of compliance. Zone of compliance. It's like remember, get smart. The cone of silence. It's re related. Com Mr. Cardona, please. And if we were to take that approach, to the extent that bought us more time to gather the data on what the operational changes accomplished, that wouldn't be a bad thing because, again, you know, there's a large number of suggestions that we have, and parsing through those and implementing those while deciding which ones actually make sense and then implementing those is not something that can be done overnight. So it's going to take some time to put those in place and then some time to gather data based on those. Okay. Additional commentary, uh, questions, suggestions for some action here. I, I just want to comment that uh, Leah's comments and George's comments have covered my point. Staffing needs, uh, we will send the proposal very soon. You will see it's not only about the number of FTEs we ask, even in the staffing needs analysis, if we look at staff members exit the interview, why they, why they leave, if we have, you know, relatively uh, <coughs> high turnover. So we, we are taking a deep dive at, the, at, at both the number and the quality of their experience in, in working in the state bar. If I could just go to the to the three issues on abatement, it sounds like the general consensus. I just want to see if I'm correct is that we would continue a status quo on abatement, but the key change being to call it something else. I think that's what we got on abatement. On the case processing standard versus the backlog metric, I'm not so clear. Mark, I think you were really clear in expressing a strong preference for option three. I'm not sure in terms of um, the rest of the board, and I, I think this is an issue, probably much more so than the abatement one, that we would like to clarify in order to finalize the report. 
I, I agree with that assessment. Um, and let me suggest that if, if the board writ large is not um, either comfortable or prepared to uh, offer further direction that this might be uh, an appropriate assignment for the discipline liaisons um, who were designated yesterday, right? Jose, Hylin, Mark, and Greg um, to take up certainly informed by this conversation and then perhaps any further conversation with George, Leah, um, and whomever else is necessary. I, I don't necessarily have a, a preference other than um, we should be cognizant of our deadline um, and enough time for staff to prepare a report for us to consider it at, at a meeting next month, which will be a special meeting anyway, right? Is that right? Yep. A uh, quick question on the just unrelated. Are, are we still statutorily required to do the public hearings on the ADR? Okay. So those need to be scheduled as well. Not on the ADR. It's the, it's, it's oh, the, the discipline yes. report. Excuse me. Thank not, you. Not on the ADR. Okay. But, sorry. <laughs> it's on the admissions uh, and then the competency one. Two public hearings, one in Southern California and one in yeah, Northern. Yeah, exactly. Before the end of the year. For some reason, I thought was on, that was to present the ADR. I could be, I, I'm misremembering. Okay, thank you. Uh, any, any thoughts on what Leah and I have just uh, laid out? <laughs> I see a lot of confused looks. I mean, it, it is it is daunting for sure, but it's uh, I think it's critical to to respond to SB two eleven and, and, and comply um, in in the face of also the the realities of what uh, George's office and and Ewing and everybody else has been doing. Uh, Greg, please. Yeah, uh, please. Mark and I uh, with George, and I hope Leah. We'll be able to. I, I suggested that we have like a virtual meeting to go over the options and to discuss them more thoroughly than they were discussed today. I am yes, and that I am, I'm suggesting that also include Highland and Jose. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. So we can do that, and and I think um, what we can also try to do is uh, get some tentative feedback from. Um, Judiciary Committee staff, and if we can, uh, the Legislative Analyst Office on this particular question, that will help perhaps inform the discipline liaisons. Uh, we'll obviously need to try to do this quickly, and I'm not sure we'll be able to, but we will try. And then I think on the last question on the staffing needs, I also didn't hear a strong preference for, for four months versus a year. Um, but what I did hear, uh, at least from you, Sean, is that we include something in this report that's due October 31st that expresses, at least in a general sense, the, that there will be additional staffing needs associated with implementing these standards. So we can make sure to accomplish that. And I see a couple of nodding heads on that last point. Could I just show of hands consensus if the board members uh, are on board with that last piece that Sean and Leah went over, essentially that approach, just so that for the four of you, for the, the four DS discipline liaisons, that, that can be an easy one taken care of, right? That approach okay? Okay. May yes, I please. add something? Um, the, I like the new standards. I, I want to, I, I want people to know that I will have an issue with the timeline for implementation of the new standards, and which basically means I don't think we should actually implement and use the new standards until there is staffing, um, uh, b uh, 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 until there's a staffing adjustment. Because if we were to apply the same standards to our current situation, it will have the impact of immediately and significantly increasing the backlog. At least that's what I fear from looking at the comparison numbers of where we start and these are more aggressive. And I just don't know the value of immediately, that's what I'm worried about, but 
that, that's part of what I'm asking you to give information about the comparison. I'm worried. If I'm wrong, that's okay. If it shows that it's reduced, fine. But I'm afraid from just looking at the numbers you gave us, George, that you know we could see a major increase in the backlog. And unfortunately, I think that's what gets looked at. And the I'm worried that the willingness of this new proposal being approved will be undermined by showing increased backlog numbers. So anyway, I'm just trying to let you know these are things we're not deciding today, but I want us to have our eyes wide open. I think it's a fair point. The the, the response that, that, I, that I think we have to have, however, is SB 211 is, I think it's clear in that the case processing standards must be adopted and that I'm assuming implemented. I, I, don't remember the language of the statute, but George George can correct me. Yeah, the, the the current statute doesn't. The current statute requires that they be proposed to the legislature by October 31st, and then calls for the legislature to adopt them. There's another provision in SB 211 that requires us for this year to report under our old standards the 180 and 365 days. Um, so I I. I don't know what will happen next year with legislative direction in terms of that because they could change that. Okay, and certainly w would not be unreasonable for us to make suggestions or requests as we further develop the response here. Okay, good enough. Any additional uh, comments for the good of the order on this topic? All right, well done everyone, thank you. Okay. That, I believe, is the end of our open session items, which will take us back into closed session. Is there any uh, anything, any announcement uh, a board member wants to make before we do that, since we're still in a public session here? And anything else? Okay, if not, uh, let's reconvene in, open, in closed session at 1130. Uh, remote trustees, you should have received, are you using yesterday's link? Yes, but I will resend the link. Okay, the, the board secretary will send the link again and we'll see you in five minutes in closed session. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we are recording and back in open session at uh, just about 1.51. Uh, this is the conclusion of the board of trustees meeting. There is um, nothing to report on any of our closed session items with the uh, the exception that in the LA Times case, uh, the board heard a uh, briefing from legal counsel and provided direction with no other reportable action. With that, we will adjourn um, and see everybody in October for a special meeting and November for our regular meeting. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.